Okay gang, here we go. We're finally starting to, to get into the really cool stuff in organic chemistry, specifically in OCHEM 1. Okay, so in this video we're going to tackle something called SN2 or the SN2 reaction. And what, the SN, what SN2 actually means is the S means substitution, the 2 means something called bimolecular, and that's not exact, like too, too important. Just to quickly explain that, basically we're going to take, you know, two molecules, oh, that marker's trash too. Oh, I'm just dropping stuff all over the place. Alright, so let's say we would, let's take structure A and structure B together to make structure C. Basically what the bimolecular aspect means is that if we increase the concentration of A, the reaction goes fast, faster, and if we increase the concentration of B, the reaction goes faster. Basically the reaction rate will go faster if you increase A or B. Similarly, it would decrease if we decrease the concentration of A or B. And I think this will make more sense when we kind of, once we kind of get into it. Okay, so basically I'm just going to show you an example and then kind of finish the example and then kind of backtrack and explain everything. Okay, so let's just say we had this structure right here, methyl bromide, if we're going to you know, flaunt our common naming abilities, right? So let me draw this guy out like this. Now, we know, throw back to stereochem, that methyl bromide is not a stereocenter, but I'm going to draw him out like this, and I think you guys will see why in a second. Okay, so let's look at methyl bromide real quick. So, oh, yikes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go, methyl bromide. So, this is a polar molecule, right? Wouldn't you guys agree that there is a delta plus, a, a positive partial charge, a po partial positive charge on this carbon that's attached to this bromine that is partially negative? Because there's an electronegativity difference there, right? We know that the halogens are, you know, more electronegative than oxygen, so this bromine is going to be stealing some electron density and pulling it towards him, right? That's what I'm going to show with this arrow. The, uh, the cross is where the electron density is coming from, and it's going towards bromine, right? So we know that this carbon is partially po positive. Okay, so based on what we learned in the last video, let's just say I threw in some nucleophile into this mix. I don't know, say hydroxide, right? Well, is something going to happen? Is nothing going to happen? Here's actually what goes on. Like we said, he's negative hydroxide. He is what we call a nucleophile, right? A lover of positive charge due to his negativity. Well, he's drawn to this partially positive carbon. So what happens is he actually takes an electron pair. And remember, I'm going to draw a mechanism here. So I'm going to move two electrons. So I'm going to use a double-headed arrow, right? not unlike what we did in the free radical mechanism. He's actually going to take these two electrons and swing in and he's going to try to bond to this carbon, right? But I have to do something else, right? Because if I form a bond with this OH and this carbon, that means I would have one, two, three, four, five bonds and that does not fly with the octet rule, right? So while this bond is forming, what we need to do is we need to kick off a group. We need to break a bond, right? Something has to go. And actually what's going to happen is, and I'll explain later why, this bromine right here, this BR, who has right now, he's a, pot, he's a zero formal charge, right? Because he has seven electrons in his control. He's actually going to break his bond with this carbon, and he's going to take these two electrons in this bond with him. So this bond is forming from this OH minus, simultaneously while this bond right here between carbon and bromine is breaking. So here's kind of the result of that electron flow. It's going to look a little like this. And again, I'm going to come back and explain more of this in a second. Okay, so here's some things we should definitely notice. We kicked off BR the bromine, right? Now he's Br minus, he's bromide ion. At the same time, you can see that the OH is, you know, behind the carbon, right? We still have everything we attached, but 
our hydroxide, this OH, now an alcohol, because we have methanol here, is facing the opposite way of the bromine. SN2 is sometimes called backside attack, because when you have your nucleophile and it's coming in to attack what we call your substrate, it can't attack from the same side, because what actually happens is the nucleophile comes in from behind of where what is called your leaving group is, in this case bromine is our leaving group, and as it bonds to whatever substrate, whatever atom you're attacking, the leaving group simultaneously, you know, leaves. And that has to happen where the leaving group is on one side and the nucleophile is coming in from the opposite side. That's why we call it backside attack. Okay, so let me highlight some things that are good for SN2. So one thing is that you need good... Uh, Actually, what I should say, instead of good, is I should say limited steric strain. And here's what I mean, okay? So, this carbon, is he sterically encumbered, right? Is he surrounded by a bunch of big groups that makes it hard for this OH to get in there and attack? No, right? He's a methyl carbon, right? There's really no big groups at all. What we're really looking for, for limited steric strain, is some carbon that is either methyl or primary, right? Because if you're methyl or you're primary, like this carbon right here, then there's not a, a lot of steric strain. This OH will have no problem getting in there to attack. Another good thing you need is a good nucleophile. And you can see that right here, right? OH minus, he's very negative, likes anything that's either positive or partially positive. He's totally very attracted to this carbon and wants to come in and bond to him. Another thing you need is um, a good, we said this before, a good leaving group. And here's what I mean by that. So, this Br minus, or this bromine, He's a good leaving group because if we kick him off, he's stable. He's okay, right? He's a weak, stable conjugate base. Other things that would be good, right? If we kicked off a Cl here, he'd be Cl minus. That's also good. However, what if we were kicking off an OH minus, right? He's not a stable, weak conjugate base. He would be a bad leaving group. You want to attack some substrate that's attached to a leaving group that if you were to kick him off, he would be able to handle a negative charge by himself. So again, that's kind of where the acid base comes in, right? If something either has resonance, has good size, good electronegativity, good hybridization, great leaving group. Your leaving group must be able to be stable on its own with a negative charge, okay? All right, let me erase this, and then I'll do another, we'll do two more examples, and then we'll wrap up our discussion of SN2. Okay, guys, so remember, I'm going to add one rule to this at the end, but the things you want to look for that's going to tip you off or to, to show you that you're doing an SN2 reaction is that you're looking for a primary or methyl substrate. Remember, we want as limited sterics as possible so our nucleophile can kind of nestle in there and attack from the back side. Then, that actually means you have to have a good nucleophile, right? We're looking for something that's very negative, something that's looking to attack, something that's a positive or a partially positive atom. And then remember, once you have your nucleophile attacking from the back side, you need some leaving group that's going to be okay with piecing out. But remember, he needs to be good and stable because nature likes stability, remember? We're not going to kick something off that's going to be bad, right? Then the reaction wouldn't happen in the first place. Okay, so let's do another quick example. I want to kind of show you that there's a stereochemistry aspect to this reaction, and then I want to add one more rule, and then we'll be done with this video. Okay. So let's just say I had ethyl chloride and let's just say, you know, I mix it together. I mix ethyl chloride, I kind of introduce it to a little cyanide ion. So I'm going to tell you right now that cyanide ion, very good nucleophile, okay? So here's kind of how the arrows would go for this reaction. So remember, he's a good nucleophile, he's attracted to positive or partially positively charged atoms. This carbon right here definitely has a partial positive charge from being bonded to this chlorine, which 
as a partially negative charge. So this Cn minus is going to come in from the back side and he's going to take his two electrons and with a double headed arrow I'm going to show that this Cn minus wants to bond to this carbon. At the same time, it's I want to stress that it's a simultaneous kind of phenomenon, this bond right here has to break because all we have are these two high bonds to hydrogen and H minus bad leaving group. We're not going to kick off an, an H, give it these two electrons and make it H minus. Not good. So it's too, er, it's too small, right? So this CO minus would be a great leaving group. So if we kick off chlorine right here and make it chloride ion, if I draw my arrow to show this electron flow, right, I would have CO minus over here, which we know to be a good leaving group. He's a weak conjugate base, right? Because if you think of HCl, where CL minus comes from, this is such a strong acid, that means the conjugate base is weak, right? Okay. Well, remember, let's draw the organic piece we just kind of produced. Right there. Okay. So, again, just another example of an SN2 reaction. Okay. But, let me draw for you guys another SN2 reaction, and I'll kind of show you how stereochemistry comes into play. Because we just did this reaction, right? This one right here, right? This, this carbon right here that we attacked, the substrate, it was not a stereocenter, right? Here's what happens if we do have a stereocenter. Look off my cheat sheet. So if I drew you guys something like this. Okay? Let's just say I throw in some I minus. Also a very good nucleophile. Okay. So you can see, let's go through our checklist. Are we primary or methyl? If you look at our carbon right here, we're attached to a Cl, a hydrogen, a deuterium, right, which is just hydrogen with, hydrogen with two neutrons. We're attached to one carbon, so we are indeed primary. And do we have a good nucleophile? Yes, we do. Do we have a good stable leaving group? If we look at this carbon, yes, chlorine, Cl- minus would be a good stable leaving group. Okay, so what you need to know about SN2 is that you invert your stereochemistry. If you attack and perform a substitution by molecular reaction, you need to make sure that your substrate at the end, or your, or your uh, structure, has inverted stereochemistry. So here's how I usually go about this. It, it's kind of like the shortcut way, it doesn't make my brain hurt. Kind of like the double switch. So if you attack, right, this I minus is going to be uh, attracted to this partial positive carbon based on this polar bond with this chlorine. At the same time as this bond forms, CL chlorine leaves as CL minus. And here's how I go about this, right? So I'll draw my leaving group over here. And then what I'll do is I redraw, you know, my carbon right here. And remember, if we switch a pair of groups on a stereocenter, we invert the stereochemistry by default. So what I do is I replace my leaving group with my nucleophile. And then I switch two groups, right? I, get, you, I can actually use this ethyl piece as a switch, but I'm just going to swap the deuterium and the hydrogen, right? So I'll put my H over here, and I put a deuterium over here, right? So even though I, you know, put the iodine exactly where the chlorine was, and this was backside attack, I still inverted the stereochemistry of this uh, product by switching the deuterium and the hydrogen, right? So that's how I usually go about it. If you see that you have a stereocenter, attack, replace your nucleophile, put your nucleophile where the leaving group was, and then doesn't matter which two groups, but switch a pair, right? I could have switched the deuterium and the ethyl group. I could have switched the hydrogen and the ethyl group. It doesn't matter, okay? Okay, so let me erase this, and then I want to make one final point, and hopefully not drop any more markers. So a little earlier in this video, I said some things that could tip you off that you're doing an SN2 reaction or things that are good conditions for an SN2 reaction are, you know, 
primary or methyl substrate, a good nucleophile, a good leaving group, and I'm going to add one more thing. If you look over your arrow, and let's just for example, I'll use acetone, right, which looks like this. If you see that you have a polar aprotic solvent, that's a dead giveaway you're going to be doing, most likely, if these all check out and you see a polar aprotic solvent, you'll be doing an SN2 reaction. And here's why. Because remember, the types of nucleophiles we're looking for, aka good ones, are probably going to be sporting some type of negative charge, right? So these polar aprotic solvents, the fact that they're polar helps kind of make these charged ions at home, right? If that doesn't kind of sound good, these charged nucleophiles, they won't necessarily get along with things like cyclohexane or diethyl ether. They're not really soluble in these types of uh, nonpolar solvents, okay? So, let's just put it this way. These charged nucleophiles, they're comfortable dissolving in polar solvents. However, it's important that they're aprotic, and here's why. Because if we had some type of, let's say we had this reaction going in CH3OH, right? We know that this hydrogen is very delta plus. It's a strong partial positive charge. Here's what happens. If you have this protic situation, this is polar, but if you have a polar protic solvent, what you get is a lot of these solvents crowding around your nucleophile, right? With your hydrogen, with the hydrogens going towards the nucleophile, because remember, partial positive, partial positive, partial positive, and it kind of traps your nucleophile, right? So polar protic kind of, uh, kind of like drags down your nucleophile from reaching where it wants to go. However, if you have a polar aprotic solvent, you don't have that problem. So kind of to summarize, you want a primary methyl substrate for good sterics so that your nucleophile can get to your substrate in SN2. You want a good nucleophile. That means we probably want something strong and charged, right, which can jive with a polar aprotic solvent because the polar aspect makes him feel okay and will let him dissolve in solution. We need a good stable leaving group, right? We're not going to kick off something that would be unstable. Nature won't let that happen. And we want a polar aprotic solvent. So it doesn't have to be acetone, right? We could have DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Put a sulfur right here. We could have DMF, right? Dimethyl formamid. Draw real quick. And I think I'm forgetting one. Maybe forgetting one, but remember, you want these types of solvents because they don't crowd your nucleophile and they allow for charged species to kind of exist in solution. Okay, gang, this is SN2. I have a worksheet where I have you do SN2 reactions. In the next video, we'll cover E2 reactions and then SN1 reactions and E1 reactions. So if you want to start doing that worksheet, go ahead, the first section is the SN2 section, and I'm telling you it's an SN2 reaction. So you can kind of start practicing looking for these four things and actually completing the reaction. Okay? All right. So this wraps the book on SN2. What we're going to do now is move into something called an elimination reaction, and it's actually going to be elimination bimolecular, a.k.a. E2.